If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure so the all familiar thorn in the flesh and we've all heard we've all heard stuff about it but today I'm going to tell you what the thorn in the flesh is I'm going to show you it's right there in the Bible in front of you now we've heard that it was uh, his eye and his eyes, because we know on the Damascus Road, his eyes got basically seared over. And uh, perhaps he had ugly looking eyes or he had scars on his eyes. That could have been it, right? Or uh, secular writing says uh, Paul was a little short, bald headed guy with bow legs. And uh, I don't put much faith in secular writings. But anyway, it could have been his something to do with his appearance or his crippledness. But. I'm going to give it to you this morning, straight from Scripture, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh. So, how about some drum rolls? <laughs> Paul's thorn in the flesh was, he stuttered. Paul was a stutterer, and he got over it, just like our president, Joseph Biden. He was a stutterer, and he got over it, and so was Paul. And I want to show it to you in the Word of God. First Thessalonians, please. We're going to see that the Apostle Paul was a stutterer, but he got over. So just like Joseph Biden, Paul had this issue. Now, if you don't believe it, follow on here as we read through three scripture references. First Thessalonians. Chapter 4, verse 8. He therefore that despises, despises, not man but God, who hath given us his Holy Spirit. Uh-oh, he stuttered, didn't he? <laughs> All right. Chapter 5, verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Stuttered again, didn't he? How about verse 7? For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. So three times in two short verses we see him stuttering. So this is the first epistle that Paul wrote. And we don't see this again, so I assume he got over it just like Joe Biden. Now, of course, I'm jesting with you. I, I'm just, just funny with you. Because I thought it was kind of neat to see this here. It's not anywhere else in the scripture. And obviously, I'm not inferring that that was his thorn in the flesh. But it was kind of neat to see it. And I thought I would point it out. And another way to look at it is, see how confused people can get from things in the Bible. Somebody could, somebody could actually be serious about something like that. And make, a, 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 a make an inference that that's what the issue was. And, of course, it's stupidity to do that. And uh, that's why I do things like that. I guess I'm not all that swift. But that has nothing to do with our Sunday school lesson today. Our Sunday school lesson today is titled, It's Nice to Be Wanted. And I want to pray before we start. Father, we love you. And we thank you for every opportunity we have to open your word and to look at it. And... Uh, Sometimes, Lord, we, we have a little fun with it, and we pray forgiveness if that's wrong of us, but we, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for what's there, and we thank you for uh, encouraging us to study it, Father. We thank you for this, this hour that we have here, and we, we, we thank you for every part of the word that we're going to look at here today. Bless our message today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 
there's a famous actor, his name is Kevin Costner, and he made a quote that was fairly well requoted. And he said, it's nice to be wanted in any capacity, is what he said. And it was requoted and on the news. And, and he seems to be a fairly sensible guy. But it, it, it certainly is nice to be wanted, isn't it? In any capacity. Not by the law, by the way, but it's nice to be wanted. It's nice to be wanted by friends and family. It's nice to be wanted, not so much nice to be needed. It, it is nice to be needed, but nice to be wanted kind of uh, uh, trumps it. You know, uh, there's uh, lots of people that need you but don't really want you. Would be you, people who would use you, that sort of thing. But it's really nice when somebody wants you, like your children or your neighbors or somebody at work that really wants to be around you. It's a warm thing. We recently lost our dog, Buddy. Our dog, Buddy, was was quite old, and uh, the, good, the good thing was he died rather quickly and, and didn't suffer a lot. But Buddy was so wonderful. He wanted us, and we wanted him. Every day when I came home from work, Buddy was out there. He wanted me. And if I'd walk outside, he'd come up and want to play. And, and it, it, was, it was a mutual thing. It was nice from my part that Buddy wanted me, and, and I know Buddy liked the fact that I wanted him. And many of us here can relate to the Uncle Sam poster. I want you. His finger pointing right out there. And no matter where you are, it looks like he's looking right at you. Uncle Sam, and then, and then the poster would say something like, I want you to to buy war bonds or mainly World War II kind of stuff. But it, it's a... a, a, a kind of poignant in this message. The caption, I want you. This pandemic is keeping us at home and uh, uh, we want to be wanted. I want, I long to be with my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I long to be with them, but I really can't and I don't think it makes sense to do it. Uh, I'd like to point at one of my children to say, I want you. I want you to come and see me and visit with me. And uh, I'm sure they feel the same way. So let's look at some examples in the Bible of people who wanted people. And then we're going to get to a final verse where we're going to see the crux of the message. Genesis 2. We'll start right in the beginning. Genesis 2. And look there at chapter 20. I mean, verse 20 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 20, Genesis. And Adam gave names to all cattle, fowls of the air, and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep, deep, a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We see the first man and woman that God created. God created beings, and Adam was the first creation. But there was no help meet for him. Adam wanted to be complete, so God made woman in the form of Eve. And these two became one, as we, as we read. One flesh. It's God's plan for children to leave their parents and find someone they want. Someone they want. Oh, how wonderful and beautiful it is to be wanted by your partner. How wonderful it is to have a wife who wants you. Not one who needs you, but one who wants you. And to have a wife that you want. Husbands and wives wanting each other. It's God's plan. It's the way God planned it. So the very first couple, Adam and Eve, wanted each other. And that's the way it was supposed to be. It said it, it, that's the way it should, it should be for a man to leave his father and mother and to take a wife. And they shall become one flesh. So here's a husband and wife. 
wanting each other. And I'm going to look at some other kinds of examples of people. Let's look into the book of Ruth. Chapter 1. We'll pick up at verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee, but, but death part thee and me. So, and when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left her speaking under, talking about uh, Naomi and Ruth here. And uh, Naomi had told the girls, you know, all the men were gone. All the men, all the men died off here. Naomi's husband and and uh, her sons died off. So all that was left was Ruth and her two daughters-in-laws. And uh, she told them, yeah, get, go back to your people. I'm going to head back to my homeland. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the one daughter... Orpha said, well, I'm going back to my folks, but Ruth said this to her. She said, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to die with you. I'm going to be buried where you're buried. She wanted to be with Ruth. Ruth wanted to be with her. So Naomi and Ruth became inseparable. And Ruth wanted Naomi so much, she was willing to go with her back to her home country where she had no kin folks. And we know the story. We, we know the whole story how when she got back to that land, Ruth and Boaz and, and uh, all of the success that they had over there, these two women from different generations and different homelands needed and wanted each other to the extent that they stayed until Ruth became the great-grandmother, the great-grandmother of David. So we know how important she was in, in the events, of uh, biblical events. Now how about two men? Let's look in 1 Samuel. Two men who wanted each other. 1 Samuel 18. Verse 3 says, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even his sword, and to his bow and to his girdle. Jonathan, the son of, wit of the wicked king, and David, a man after God's own heart, wanted each other to the extent that that. They loved him as his own soul. It says David loved Jonathan as his own soul. They wanted each other. It's nice to be wanted. Can you imagine how David felt to be wanted by Jonathan, the son of the man that was trying to kill him, that had tried to kill him? It's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable story when you think about it. But it was nice to be wanted. Few of us, myself included, have ever had a friend as close as Jonathan was to David or David to Jonathan. I can't name anybody that close. I've had some friends, but nothing like that. It was a wonderful story in the Bible and, 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 and how sad it must have been when, uh, when Jonathan and his dad died and, and David heard about it. It, it had to have been a really sad thing. Remember what David did. He, he promised to take care of the offspring, the family. So... It was nice to be wanted by Jonathan for David's viewpoint. Second Kings now, just keep on moving. Second Kings, Second Kings chapter 2. We'll see another pair in the Bible who wanted each other. Second Kings 2. Starting in verse 2, we'll just read. Verse 2 says this, 
And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Verse 6 says, And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. Now we see the two prophets, Elijah, about to be taken up to heaven, and Elisha, the prophet. And Elijah begins to leave, but Elisha wants him. I will not leave thee, he says. We see Elijah's feelings for Elisha in verse 9. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Verse 10, And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken up from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. <laughs> the old prophet wanted Elisha to have his life's desire. But what did he want? A double portion of Elijah's spirit. It's amazing that two prophets wanted each other that much. These were the prophets really replacing each, replacing uh, him. And uh, both of them felt that kind of want for each other. I want a double portion. I want a double portion of what you've got. What a, what a testimony that would be for a Christian. Or to another Christian. I want a double portion of what you've got. Anyway, here we see, first we saw uh, Adam and Eve, and then we saw the two ladies. We saw Jonathan and David. We see the two prophets. But in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, we'll see Paul Second Corinthians in chapter 7. Verse 13 says this. Therefore, we are comforted to your comfort, yea, exceedingly more joy for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if you have boasted anything to him, I am not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth. And his inward affliction is more abundant towards you. His inward affection is more abundant towards you. Whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in, in all things. Paul loved and wanted this man, Titus. He wanted him to be with him. And he placed him in uh, mission churches at Corinth. Look at chapter 8, verses 3 through 7. For in their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying as much that we receive the gift and take upon as fellowship of the ministering of the saints, that this they did, not as they hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so that he would finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything and in faith and utterance and knowledge and in diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. And then verse 23. Whether any of you inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you or our brethren be inquired of. They are messengers of the church and the glory of Christ. Titus and Paul had a special relationship, saying here uh, that he was his partner. Paul had lots of friends that he worked with, 
and the various churches and ministries that he started. But Titus was very special to him. He loved Titus. He wanted Titus. It was nice to be wanted. If we look over at Titus, real quickly. Chapter 1, verse 4 says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Like a son. That's how Paul thought of Titus, like a son. That would be somebody that he wanted. Paul traveled extensively and he met many people. Many people who he prayed for, as he's recorded in his word. And many people who he wanted to be near. Look in Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. Verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I gave thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Oh, how he must have wanted these two, Priscilla and Aquila, his helpers in Jesus Christ, offered their lives, it says, for this cause. Paul uh, especially wanted people who were willing to offer their lives. Remember the times he was in jail and beaten? Typically, there was somebody else with him. Paul and Silas, right, down in the Philippian jail. Paul, Paul had lots of friends. He had lots of people who wanted to be with him and he wanted to be with. Uh, the exception may be Demas, huh? <laughs> Possibly, but... Paul, Paul had lots of friends that he wanted to be with. Next, we remember the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch, I everybody remembers the story there, but in Acts. Verse 30 says, And Philip ran thither to him, in verse 30, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he did what he desired, Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. So the eunuch wanted Philip. He wanted him. He wanted him to expound the scripture. And certainly Philip wanted to lead him to Christ, right? Certainly he did. So there's a mutual wanting there again. He ended up, you know, leading him to uh, salvation and actually baptizing him. When we witness, we should have a want for the purpose that we're witnessing to. It's not just a thing we do. We want, we want that person to receive. We want that person to want Jesus is what we want. Well, that's the way it should be. But what about Jesus? Does he want something? What does Jesus want? Revelation 3. What does verse 20 say? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So not only does Jesus want us, he's going to be knocking on our door. He's going to be knocking on our door. You know what? He knocked on my door a lot of times. I went to the other room a lot of times. I went to the back room while he was knocking on my door. Maybe plugged up my ears or something, but he knocked on my door. Jesus wanted me, and he kept on knocking. He kept on knocking till I opened the door, and then guess what? I wanted him. That's the way it works. 
Jesus wanted me, and that's wonderful. When I finally accepted Jesus, I realized he'd been wanting me all along. He'd he'd been wanting me knocking all, all along. John chapter 13. chapter 13 the first verse says now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of the world unto the father having loved his own which were in this world he loved them to the end Jesus is talking to his beloved disciples and he loved them and wanted them to the very end think about all this happening in the upper room and when Jesus was with his disciples and and after Judas had left and he's getting ready to go out to the garden. Remember when he went out to the garden? What did he do? He called his three special disciples to come and pray with him. Peter, James, and John. He wanted to come and pray with him. He wanted them to be with him in his, his final prayer there. In the garden, his last time in the garden, he wanted to be there. I think that's in chapter 17. Let's look over there. Just look at that. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Jesus is praying here. Uh, Look at maybe verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they be one, even as we are one, and I in them, and thou in me, that they be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Think about that. Before the foundation of the world, God loved us think about the abortion issue going on and you think about us, the fact that God loved us before we were even known, before we were even conceived. He he knew who the disciples were going to be and he loved them and and now he's saying I want them to be with me. I want Father, I want the disciples to be with me. Let me ask this question. Do you want to know you're wanted? Do you want to know you're wanted? Do you want to know someone is looking for you? You know, we got all this all this technology now, we got all this social media. You can get on there and find all kind of people who say they want you. For the most part, they're just people who need you for money or for some advantage. But there are uh, not too many people like that would have the relationship like Jonathan and David had that you could find. Certainly not on social media, you're not going to find anybody like that, but you might meet somebody like that in your life, and it would be wonderful if you did. But I want to go to the number one thing that spurred me to start thinking about this, and that's in the book of James, chapter 5. Why did, I, why did I think it important to talk about uh, the fact that it's nice to be wanted? Some spurred this on me. When I was looking at this scripture, chapter 5 of James, verse number 7. I want to read this slowly. 
Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rains. Grasp what it's saying here. God wants you. He's the farmer. He wants his crop. He's waiting patiently for his crop. What a thought it is. God wants us, the church, the people of the church, the, the people who have accepted him, the harvest. It's the most wonderful thing to think about. That, you know, what we do as Christians, I hate it. We've been taught that we're so inadequate that we're just going to be tolerated. We're going to get into heaven in the lowest level. I mean, I mean, I know that's not true, but I mean, it's just the kind of the thought we have if we're really honest about how we think about it. I'm no good. I'm a sinful person. And even after being saved, I still submit to sin. And so when I get into heaven, I've got to hide or something to stay out of the way because I'm just, I'm just about the entry-level guy that made it in there. No, it ain't like that, guys. God wants us. He got a place for us. He, God has a spot for every one of the people who have accepted Jesus as the covering for their sins. All of those sins, even the sins we currently do, they're covered up, folks. Those sins are covered, and God wants us. I want. It's nice to be wanted. It's nice to be wanted by my wife, my children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. It's nice to be wanted by all that. But it's wonderful to be wanted by God. It's wonderful. And I can read it right here. I can read it right here. God's the farmer. He's the husbandman. He is going to harvest the crop. Now, what's he going to do with the crop? Let's look over there, back over in uh, 1 Corinthians. What's he going to do with that crop? Oh, this is, this is one of my favorite verses. I love this verse here. Chapter 15 I love that whole chapter, by the way. <clears throat> I'm talking about somebody asked, uh, somebody asked, what uh, what kind of body we're going to have when we get in heaven? And the answer here in verse 38, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. What a beautiful picture. Yeah, yeah. He's the husband of He's, he's the guy in charge of the crop. And every person who's saved is a special plant in that garden that God plants. It's nice to be wanted because I am the flower that's going right there. I'm the flower God's pick. I'm the whatever weed or whatever it is, whatever God wants, I'm the it. And he's going to put it somewhere. So summing it up, it really is nice to be wanted. In our time on earth, we meet people we want to be around. We meet certain people we want to be around. And Kevin Costner had it right. In any capacity, we meet. We, it's nice to be wanted in any capacity, you know, to help them or, or just to, to talk with them or to, for, you know, give them money or all kind of things. We might have a friend like David and Jonathan had. Or folks that we've worked around in the ministry, all of us, they have been in the ministry for some time. We've had some great friends. And, and, and I just lost one recently that I worked with in the ministry. He passed away. And I have fond thoughts. He was a wonderful friend. Similar to what David and Jonathan were. Or like Paul and Titus, but perhaps. Or maybe a pet that we had that we really loved. And a pet that really loved us like our old buddy was. It's it's we, we can have lots of things, uh, lots of people and things that want us, and we can want lots of things that are wonderful. But at the end of the day, James 5, 7, going back to it again. This is where I want to leave off here. Read the, these two verses here. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for his precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. That means God wants us. Verse 8, 
And be ye patient, establish in your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and he is coming for us. That's the other half of it. He wants us and he's coming for us. Can't hardly beat a deal like that, can you? God is good. It's nice to be wanted. And God wants us. Can't beat a trio like that. That's right. He's coming for us. And, and I'm so thankful for it. I'm thankful that Jesus knocked. I opened. And now God wants me. Can't be a deal like that. Thank you for your patience. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us that, that people are wanted, even by people and animals sometimes, and that we want things. But the biggest thing of all that we can focus on today is the fact that you actually want us and that you're coming for us. It's the most wonderful thought that I can imagine right now. Uh, it, it offsets all of the bad news and all of the troubles and trials that we go through. We thank you for it and we, we pray, Lord, that you continue to encourage us and strengthen us. Help us to love you more and to stay in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.